Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to Wild Goose. I think we actually fit. Uh, we have more more chairs than I. Well, I don't know. People come come in as we're going. Um, and but um, I'm glad you're here uh, in this room. We are having conversations about what we're going to do about our growth. Um, and like I said, you know, we we're not going to put it on our. Facebook page, uh, the slogan isn't going to be size doesn't matter, you know, but uh, <coughs> we're not trying to grow, um, it's just happening, and um, so we're having conversations about what we're going to do to, to uh, and we'll, we'll hear more from from Heather and, and Jennifer, uh, there there might be a, a, they call it evening with Henry Rojas, I, I think, you know, I know it sounds kind of... Uh, egotistical and you know exalting of Henry but we can do better uh, so no I'm just kidding <laughs> um, we can even do better no uh, but an evening with Henry Rojas kind of evening and potluck and kind of thing and and look at the possibility of meeting in a different area that will be able to accommodate a lot of that growth without turning into a, a, a mega church and not having the intimacy I think everybody feels that way right we don't want to lose that those aspects of what are going on um, and the only way to prevent that from happening uh, is not to keep people out, but to adapt and adjust without, without making programs, uh, without hiring staff. Um, we're all apart. We all participate. And I think we saw that happen last Sunday, uh, you know, when, when, when Deb stood up and said she's starting a women's group, doesn't know what the heck she's doing, but she is going to put out her in, available and people signed up. That's so great. Um, you know, and, and uh, uh, Roman Gabriel said that he, uh, I call him Roman Gabriel, he's Roman, but uh, You're aging I'm yourself. aging myself, but it's only because I called him Gabriel so many times uh, for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, uh, you know, he offered to anybody who'd like to join him in, in going to feed the homeless uh, or whatever you were doing last Sunday in the, in the evening. And that's the kind of thing that grows out of this, right? Um, uh, spontaneous uh, expressions of who we are, not trying to do something so we can become who we would hope to be, just being who we are. Uh, many talents, there's many talents. I mean, there's talents in this room we're unfamiliar with of the people, what people have, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's, you know, uh, whatever it is. Um, and um, and to be able to find a safe place to be able to express who you are, um, I think that's what the scriptures were teaching about. Uh, not everybody is a uh, you know in that language it was not everybody's a teacher or an evangelist or you know the hospitality person or a, a, a chair ranger. We will support around them, but everybody has their thing. You know, um, this is what I do uh, a lot because of I'm lousy in a whole lot of other areas. Um, but what I, what I feel like I do and what I'm most comfortable with is on display, uh, but you don't see me uh, at home when my sister is trying to teach me how to screw in an anchor in the wall to hang something, <laughs> you know? And, um, and, and, and the, real, the real key isn't what we don't know, it's how aware is of it that we don't know what we don't know. How honest and aware are we? Because I'm challenged every day with the possibility of hiding what I don't know. Aren't you? I mean, every day we're, uh, we're challenged by the, the threat that we're going to be exposed to something. That we're somehow going to have to come clean. And, um, and it's with the smallest of things. It's with the smallest of things. We, we tend to think it's about the big things but in reality, um, we don't want to admit that we didn't know something or that we're wrong. It's almost like uh, the, the foundation beneath our feet would be shaken and we might fall apart, when in reality is it wasn't much of a foundation anyway. <coughs> the, the beautiful letdown of the spiritual life is letting the foundation below you break down. And, and that's why Switchfoot wrote the song, The Beautiful Letdown. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, what I went through. But man, am I glad it happened. Man, am I glad it happened. Because what I was standing on was the false conceptions of what I had created myself to be. I was acting as the one that I really wanted to be instead of 
being the person that God says I am. Seeing myself as God sees me. That's what this is about. You know, it, 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 on Facebook and the community page, I, I finally put something on there between Sundays. Uh, it was close. It was Friday. It was close. Um, but, you know, when we look around the world and we, we see the things that fall apart, it's usually, usually coming from people who are not wanting to admit that things are falling apart and putting spins on things and self-protecting that somehow I'm going to give others a bad name or myself a bad name if I actually apologize for something or admit I was wrong. You know, we have to have wisdom in those aspects of it. We're in the tiny room. Come on up, because you're my friends. Come up in the uh, high five area, Cody. Wet zone. <laughs> yeah, up in here, the first two, two rows, you will get wet. So, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not, it's not SeaWorld. Uh, and um, and so when you think in terms of that, it's like, is, is, that, is it that simple? Is it that simple? Is that simple to say, is it that simple to say that I actually can do something by being honest? Yeah, I do believe so. I do believe so. To be able to at least be able to say, you know what? I think this, and I might be wrong. That makes you not impenetrable. And it allows you to have a dialogue. We are a, a group here at Community Wild Goose who's come from many different theologies. One of the first things I might ask somebody who has struggled for years in, some, in their personal life and they were raised in a Christian environment and raised in a very religious environment, my first question sometimes is, you know what, we can work on this, but are you ready to have your theology shaken to the core? Are you, really, are you ready to let go of what you believed and risk that you could be wrong? And you know what we come to? We come to not a place where we realize we're wrong, ever. We realize we don't know what the heck we're talking about that there's so much more truth that I only had a fragment. That's what we end up. The letdown isn't that I was wrong. The letdown was that I only had partial truth. And scripture says, though I see through a glass darkly, dimly, soon I shall see face to face. We're not at that point where we see face to face. On the big things, but on the little things, our lenses are clearing up. And that's the good news. And it's such a beautiful letdown. I liked it when I was in charge. Or at least I was hanging on the illusions that I thought I was in charge. I thought I was helping God out, you know, make things happen. Interfering with the stuff that was going on with my kids, thinking it was a godly thing to do. Because it's only for their, 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 it's all for their own benefit. Somehow, uh, rob them of the experience of understanding by hanging on to the rigidity of the rules in their head. And then I came to the end of myself. And Psalm 32 says it all in verse 10 through 13. It says, created me a clean heart. No, that's the wrong one. Psalm 32, verse 3 to 6. Take 2. <laughs> when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions. I didn't get a text, by the way. I was turning off the music. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> It's all business now. It's all true stuff. I, know, I just realized that looked really weird. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I have to call you later. All right. Yeah. No. It's all music. It's all tech. It's all tech going on. All right. <laughs> then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Notice it says the guilt of my sin. It doesn't say my guilt. This is the guilt of my sin. We are ravaged and tormented by guilt and shame. 
that hovers over us like a black cloud and yet it's absolutely unnecessary. It's our guilt and shame. Somebody said it so wisely one time, we're not punished. We're not punished for our sins. We're punished by our sins. The guilt of my sin. We want to even the score. We want to somehow fix it. We want to uh, run an end around before people find out who we really are. And what we're denying them of is our humanity. We're showing them our self-righteousness instead of showing them our humanity. And that's why it's so awesome when we meet somebody who's genuine and authentic and they tell a story and they seem like such a knucklehead and you're like, I want to go have coffee with that guy. Isn't it true? It's not the one who is, you know, you're like, something's going on. Something's going on. Call him slick. You know? Something's happening. It's the honesty, it's the awkwardness, it's the reality of who we are, it's the beautiful letdown. The healing aspect of our spiritual life is humility. It's humility. It will heal. All you have to do is look at leaders. Ask yourself. I might agree here, I might agree with this stuff. I might, is that person displaying humility? Just ask yourself. Because you know what? God says He doesn't want sacrifice and obedience. He says He wants a contrite heart and a broken spirit. Look at the people who are preaching and teaching and guiding and leading. Do you see humility? Do you see a contrite heart? Do you see a broken spirit? Like, oh, you can't lead from that. Really? Because you know what? To me, it seems like you'd be more trustworthy. But once you're in over your head, once you've gone too far, once you've propped yourself with scaffolds, all it takes is one little child to push like that, and it all comes tumbling down. Isn't it true? We're not as strong as we think we are. Ask yourself. And then ask yourself, what place and what part do I play in this thing that's going on? Where's my humility? Where's my contrite heart, my broken spirit? I'm not going to tell you it's easy because every day, every day, I think I'm right. As I look and I make observations, I have a soul sister on that one, right? Because we're passionate and, and why and what did you and I want to blog and I want to do this. All of a sudden, the beam and the splinter make a whole lot more sense. How can I see to take the splinter out of my brother's eye or my sister's eye when I have a beam in my own? No, not on this one, not on this issue. No, no I don't, no, no I don't. Right then I do. Immediately when I say that I do. Humility is not the solve, and I'm not saying to, to solve the world's problems, I'm talking about the world of my problems. The kingdom of heaven on earth. My sphere of influence. Okay, let me tell you a quick little story. Um, so, Ken Blanchard does this, this teaching in businesses. He's the one who wrote the One Minute Manager uh, years ago, and he had all these other business books. And Ken Blanchard was leading this... Uh, 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 it's called Lead Like Jesus. And we had a company of about 500 employees and we had a, a management uh, uh, retreat and he led the thing and we divided up into groups and we had the CEO over here, the COO over here, the CPO and the CP3R uh, and uh, we, had, we had all these guys, you know, and uh, in different groups spread out with um, a lower level workers and higher management and everybody. And so Ken gets up there and he says, so here's the story. There's a, 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 a colonel, and his name was something or other Scott. I don't remember the Scott. <coughs> and uh, his wife, well, during the Civil War, his wife was killed um, in a collision of, uh, 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 I think it was an, an ocean, a ship in the ocean or something like that, and there was a collision and his wife died. 
and it was during the middle of the Civil War, and he went to his commanding officer and said he wanted to go home and bury his wife. And he said, no, we, you know, the Civil War, man. <laughs> we were, you know, there's a lot going on here. We can't lose you. We have men counting on you. Not right now. He goes higher. And he asks somebody else. No, nope, can't do it. He takes it so far as he goes to President Lincoln. And he says what the situation is. And President Lincoln gives him this beautiful reasoning for why he can't leave right now. He says there are many people dying. I understand that, but you know what? Evidently, you don't know what's on my plate is either. I have this, and I have this, and I have this, and the country's problems, and whatever. We need to share the sufferings together. You need to get back there and do your job. I understand, but go back and do your job. So Ken told the story, and then we separated <laughs> into groups and talked about what, whether that was the right thing or the wrong thing. And it was amazing to hear people say, you know, that was the practical thing to do. Painful, a lot going on, and it seems that's what's right. And after we all gave our answers and proudly had a representative from each group, and I'll never forget, one of our uh, top management people proudly said, you know what, this is what you have to do. You have to do the hard thing. You have to make the hard choices. You got to move forward. And after we were all done, Ken got up and he said, here was Lincoln's response after that. He sat with great remorse. He went to uh, the uh, uh, Scott, he went to Scott and he said, he, he held his hand, they said he held his hands in his face, he held his face in his hands. And he said, I am so sorry. I'm sorry, I was wrong. If we're fighting for anything, we're fighting for the hearts of mankind. If there's any time a person should be able to deal with whatever they're dealing with, it's right now, and a, and a coach came up and he called for the coach to take him to be with uh, his family and bury his wife. Every one of our management level people had said that he did the right thing. <laughs> and Lincoln knew he did the wrong thing. He did the wrong thing. It happens from the inside out. In our own lives, in our own lives, we need to let the compassion of Christ send a coach for us because we have to admit we're dying to ourselves and our ego. That we are grieving the loss of the way that we wanted it to be. So that we can allow the God who loves us to say, I'm going to make something out of your brokenness and out of your contrite heart and your broken spirit. I'm going to make you penetrable. I'm going to make you the kind of man or woman or ch <laughs> child that other people want to hang out with because you're the real deal. I want to make you the person that when you spill on your shirt, you don't go into panic mode that people are going to see the stain, that they're going to think that you, you picked it out of the closet and said, ah, oh, wear that anyway. Okay, now I'm talking about myself. Right? I can't tell you how many places my kids have seen me walk around with a wet spot on my shirt because I took ice out of the glass in the restaurant to clean it real quick. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm right. <laughs> but I made everybody else in panic mode too. Dad, you spilled. Oh my God, because they know. You know, you, you, you can't play because you're worried about things happening in the house. You can't throw a party because you want the best party, so you're going to stress out. Image is everything. Image there. There's a great scene, and and uh, I guess I started the message, and I'm almost done now. But um, <laughs> just kind of roll, roll right into it. There's a great scene in a movie called The Philadelphia Story. You ever see that with uh, Cary Grant, Jimmy Stewart, and Catherine Hepburn, right? And uh, Catherine Hepburn is the high society woman, and there's the big wedding is going to take place, and Jimmy Stewart, who I just love, is the uh, 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 newspaper, high society writer, and he's watching all this stuff go on. And Cary Grant's the husband or ex-husband or whatever that's involved, right? And they're having, 
You see all these conflicts, and she's so together, and the house is together, and they're getting ready for this big wedding, and uh, Cary Grant and her are having this big fight, and, um, and then he leaves, and he comes back, and he says, why can't you just fall once in a while? Why can't you just fall, trip and fall once in a while? You never trip and fall. And she goes, really? You think that's a good thing? You think that would be a good thing for me to trip and fall? Why do you think that would be a good thing to watch me trip and fall? And he says, because I, it wouldn't be that I would be watching you. I'd get to catch you. And you'd never give me a chance to catch you. And I love that scene. I think that's what Jesus is saying to us. Though in very nature God, he did not see equality with God as something to be grasped, but lowered himself even to the form of a servant. That's pretty powerful, right? If Jesus is our mentor, and he says, first off, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. Okay, so... When we, in the next days to come, um, we are going to be reviewing a lot of the things I've taught at Calvary and in here, and one of them is belong, believe, behave, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, we're going to address that every once in a while, because you see that happening all the time, and it is an essential aspect of who we are. Because in our culture, we have been taught that you were, in our Christian culture, in our religious culture, we were taught that you need to behave first. Get it together. Behave. But before we can actually trip and fall and know that we're going to fall safely, we need to know that we belong. So you're going to see this throughout Scripture that it's belong first. Because belong has to do with truth and our identity. It's who we are. So in this scripture it says, first off, therefore if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love. The consolation of love here, this word love, I talk about the agapaho love, the welcoming love, but this is the, the real deal. This is the agape love. This is the unconditional love. This is the love that you can't do anything to earn. This is the kind of love that we don't do with other people because we can't. We can pretend to. I love you unconditionally. Baloney. <laughs> Impossible. Only God can love in the agape love, but we can allow that love to work in us and through us. I can say to somebody, I don't like you, but God loves you through me, and I, I guess I'm going to love you. That's dishonest, right? You don't have to like somebody. But you can open yourself in a willingness to let God love them through you. Okay. So if there is any consolation of love, in other words, you are consoled with the idea that God loves you indiscriminately and unconditionally, and that still blows my mind. I keep giving him reason to change his mind. <laughs> but every time I read the scripture, there isn't anything in there. There isn't anything there that would say, as a matter of fact, he even says it bluntly, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Not even my own self-loathing. Shoot. I guess I'll have to take it. <laughs> if there's any consolation of, why would I be disappointed about that kind of thing? Because I want to be God. If I'm loved unconditionally, indiscriminately, it means I feel like I'm not special. Or it can actually mean the opposite, that I feel enormously special. It depends on which way you want to go. Okay? The opposite of humility in these situations, by the way, is not pride. It's guilt. It's guilt. When I experience a, a, a spectacular gift of God's grace, and I feel undeserving, I'm like, oh... I really don't deserve it. I guess, all right, you know. I feel so guilty, though. I'm so sorry what I did that you had to, like, do grace. That I, I put you in that position, God. I, I'm the one. I put you in the position to have to give me grace. Sorry. No, it's not that way. 
It's when we see the performance of grace. Here's the way I look at it. I have an applause addiction. I'm in recovery for applause addiction. As a performer, I have applause addiction, okay? I didn't ask a girl on the date unless I knew it was a guarantee she'd say yes. I have applause addiction, all right? I didn't have a move because I didn't ever get close enough to use a move. So I wouldn't know what to do anyway because I want to guarantee the outcomes that the applause would, good job. Good job, Rojas. I love the way you threw the arm out there in the movie, you know? Because I was desperately afraid that the response would go, boo! <laughs> applause addiction. Making 14,000 people in a stadium, in an arena, cheer and laugh. The fear that you might bomb tonight is gut-wrenching. And then afterwards, when it works well and you get a standing ovation, it's intoxicating. Mm -hmm. So you go from fear of uh, hate and ridicule for what you did in public to intoxicating power of look what I did. It can drive you nuts. See, so when God performs His grace, and I'm dealing with applause addiction and trying to please Him, it's me being up on the stage trying to tap my, tap dance my way into God's heart and to make Him happy and please Him until He finally says, Henry, get off the stage. Yeah, but I'm, I'm trying to please you. It's a great show. It's a great show. <laughs> Give to charity, right? Lead a Bible study. Pray out loud. Be humble with my words. <laughs> Until you wear yourself out. And God says, Henry, get off the stage. Come and sit over here and watch. And you're the only one in the Orpheum. And you're sitting there. And because of who you are, God performs this magnificent one God play See what I did there? Uh, one God play on grace. And you see this enormous performance. You're stunned because you've never seen a performance like that before. And all you can do is what? Applaud. Now you know what worship is. Worship isn't to fix yourself before God. Worship is a thank you and a gratitude for what already is that you didn't earn, okay? So that's the aspect of grace. So Jesus, knowing that he is the man, that he has the corner on grace and love and compassion, that he is that word that was before time and is present, though in very nature... God did not see equality with God as something to be grasped but lowered himself even to the form of the servant. And then it says what happens it says so it says do not do nothing from selfish or empty conceit but with humility of mind regard one and one another as more important than yourselves and that's not codependence thing okay that's not what that's don't go there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to be codependent is, is it's awful to be around that codependency or to have that code. There's even a worse one. It's codependency in the name of God. Okay, that's self-righteous indignation. That's, that's false humility. No, 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 we are powerful in our humility. And that's, that's an amazing place to go. Okay, it's a decision that's made like Jesus. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. We always talk about, you know, church always wanting us to work towards being Christ-like. <laughs> if God thought it important to become human-like, why am I trying to be God-like? <laughs> Maybe we ought to be more human, more authentic. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him. So he was lifted up. He was exalted instead of him exalting himself. Ask yourself, are the people that you follow, 
Do they exalt themselves or do they exalt the weak and do they exalt God? Just ask yourself that. Forget about being right on an issue or on a thing or anything else like that. Just ask yourself, do they exalt themselves or do they exalt um, God and others? Very important thing. Ask yourself that. Ask yourself that. Do they know where they come from? The belongingness, the truth, the identity. When we realize our identity, once we come to the end of ourself, now all of a sudden we start to be told, here's the deal, the false self is everything that we've created the, about who we are, okay? It's, it's our perception of things, it's everything, it's everything. The false self is all of that. What is true self? The true self is consciousness itself. As Richard Rohr, as Thomas Merton, as James Finley, it's consciousness, what does that mean? It means that I can step back consciously and look at that fraud that I am over there. Congratulations! If you have that, you have awareness, you are now living out your true self as you look at the self you had created. That's not really who I am. Does you have to find yourself like that? You do something and you're like, who was I right then? Oh my gosh. That's a consciousness. It's consciousness itself. Right? That humility, that aspect of it. So we're going to be talking about, first, before we get into the behavior of the humility and aspect of us knowing, who, uh, knowing the fact that we belong. Why? Because then this is where belief comes in. And belief is about our thoughts. Belief is about our thoughts. So then the believing is not the abracadabra prayer. Okay? Jesus, come into my heart. Ta-da! I'm in, and you're out. Now I have to join groups to go get people to come in. No, it's about metanoia. It's about repentance metanoia, which is the Greek word for changing your mind. See, I, I thought I was, I thought my, you know what, didn't smell. I thought I was in control. I was wrong. Now am I going to join with the truth that I'm not really in control? Now I'm believing. I, I didn't know that I, God was, I didn't realize God was just, uh, wasn't just tolerating me that he actually loved me indiscriminately now I'm going to believe it because that's going to be my strength that make more sense so I, I accept that I belong I'm going to learn how to change my thoughts and believe so now what's the role of behavior behavior is a fruit it's a fruit out of the fact that I believe that I belong. So now we are changing the way that we're thinking in the hopes that our behavior will change, but it's planted in the understanding of our belonging that it's nothing that I did to earn it, that it is God's gift. And when we start to live that out, now you're going to have longevity in love, longevity in recovery, longevity in all the different aspects of your life in this journey. Because you know that you always have to go there. Does that change some of that for some of you in the idea of knowing you already belong? Does it almost feel audacious to think that you already belong? It should. It should. Because see, the ego wants to think that they in some way earned it. A little bit, right? Even the prayer. I lowered myself and I humbled myself before God. Aren't I awesome? <laughs> no. No, you're not at all. See, I, I used to think that I needed to feel worthy. I used to think I needed to feel, I need to deal with my feelings of insecurity. I got to be more secure with myself. I got to work on my insecurity. I, I, I probably, over the years growing up, I probably would have had a bookshelf of all kinds of feeling better about myself books. Never really worked, I got to tell you. Because I'm always battling with myself about myself. Right? And it's just hard. Until one day I realized that the expectation of me being worthy is not real. 
that God didn't expect me to feel worthy. He wanted me to acknowledge that I am unworthy. Well, that's a blow to the ego. But it's also a very simple solution. When I tell that self-created monster bully inside my head that says, what makes you think you're worthy? And I can answer it this way. You're right. I am unworthy. I am totally unworthy. Nevertheless, God has declared me worthy. Truth. He has declared me worthy. If it's that I need to feel a better self-esteem, it's over here. If I realize that God has declared that I have esteem at all, it's over here. Do you see how this works? Now I am just changing the way I'm thinking to get in line with the way that God sees me already. Boom. That is powerful. All of our self-help, all of our therapy, all of our work is not working on this area. It's working on the way I'm thinking about the fact that I belong. So when you go to a religious church or religious experience where they tell you that you need to behave, it is actually in total opposite of what God through Christ has said to you. Stop trying to earn it. Bask in the truth of my love. Let the truth of your identity sink in. <clears throat> Be like a child. Why? Because children don't know any better than to take the love of those who are in charge. They don't know any better that they need to earn it. Tell me an infant that is feeling insecure about themselves and their worthiness to be loved. You know, I mean, seriously, what child is born into this world and the parents say, listen, we're bringing you home from the hospital, okay? But there's gonna be some responsibilities, okay? We got some expectations, okay? There isn't a baby, an infant, that's going to hear that because they have to go through a period of belonging because they're going to mess up. You know, thank God infants can't talk. What if they apologized every time they pooped their diaper? I'm so sorry. Yeah, that was a bad one, wasn't it? Oh, no, they just move on. It's all yours. Here you go. Wrap it up. All right? There's my gift to you and the world. By the way, it's really good on plants. You know, I mean, it's not, that's not how that works when you're in that period of belonging. When you're in the period of belonging, you, in God's hands, are absolutely mistake prone. You are absolutely emotional. You feel everything, you experience everything, and it, even to the child, it feels like Gordon uh, Dalby in his book, Ma Healing of the Masculine Soul, it feels like when the mother goes to warm up a bottle that they have left for all of eternity. And the baby screams at the top of their lungs. Screams and screams and screams because they are, their perception, their perception is that mom's never coming back. She's the only one who knows she's going to be back with the bottle in a minute, right? But the baby is screaming. I'm sorry, but even as an adult in relationships, I've been like that. <laughs> oh, I should probably text. I should. No, I can't. No, yeah, no. I want the bottle. <laughs> right? Well, that had more metaphors there than anybody liked to admit, right? <laughs> That screaming, that we're like little babies. We're like little babies. And the minute the bottle comes, boom, it's in the baby's mouth, and it's as though nothing was ever wrong. <laughs> you know? At the same time, we come as a child absolutely dependent because that teaches us over a period of time, mom will come back. It teaches us that God is there. I will never leave you or forsake you. It will feel sometimes like I'm not present, but that has no bearing on reality or truth. <sighs> what a relief. Resting in that truth. If we can get that and start to use humility in that regard, now we're on to something.